asking me to watch all the Marvel movies again <laughs> with you right now, like during this pandemic, because that sounds pretty, pretty fun. And I was like, maybe, you know, we'll see how long this stretches out and then I'll get back to you. <laughs> and of course, you frantically then pivot to the Harry <laughs> Potter series, which is at least yeah. Um, yeah, you yeah. Know, less of a, a time it's suck uh, you know, in eight movies yeah. instead of 23. Yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting because there is something very comforting about franchises, um, and there can be something very aggravating about them, too. Sometimes, uh, and here is, and I don't consider myself a Marvel fan, I should note, too, I am very much a neophyte when it comes to the comic books. I don't, didn't read them. Um, I am not one of those viewers who, when you stick around to the end credits and you watch The Sting and you, you the coda and, and you suddenly just, you know, you hear this, these gasps of recognition right. in the audience around you. Breaking I never applause, yeah. <laughs> and I've always just been like, huh, what's going on? Okay, oh, that person, okay. Wait, yeah. what, what, you yeah. know, just very- You're asking for help. <laughs> I'm asking for help. I need a flow chart. Um, yeah. you know, somebody please draw me a flow chart to keep track of all the various uh, masked and caped individuals flying through the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, but you know, I understand, you know, as someone who likes his share of uh, other franchises, there's, there, there's a degree, there's a something comforting about these movies. And I think it's a very fine line sometimes between uh, movies where the repetition is comforting and, you know, when it's, the repetition is actually just kind of annoying because you feel like they're just falling back on cliches and conventions. Um, I do say though that I, you know, I really did like uh, the Avengers in 2012, at least because it seemed like such an improvement on the movies that had come before. Um, you know, I liked Iron Man. I, I thought Robert, you know, Robert Downey Jr. is of course one of the series bright spots and he is the, 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 most, the actor who I think will be most associated with this series going forward. Um, but, you know, movies like Thor and Captain America, the first Avenger, I just found really erratic and really dull. So watching Whedon kind of put it all together and infuse it with his signature wit and his pop culture savvy, there really did seem to be this kind of sense of momentum and convergence, the sense of like, okay, now this thing is finally firing on all cylinders. I mean, that was my experience. Did you have some of that when you first saw it? Yeah, because now it seems like this whole thing is just, there's an inevitability about it, you know. But back then, you're right, the first five movies had kind of ranged in quality. So you didn't know, uh, you know, is it all going to come together with the Avengers? Uh, I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned the titles. There was also an Iron Man sequel that wasn't all that great. And then there was the Edward Norton Thor. So... I mean, you had five movies of varying quality, and you also had, you know, a lot of other um, comic book superhero movies that weren't necessarily, uh, you know, knocking us out. So, yeah, I mean, when we did this conversation in print, you know, writing back and forth about adventures and rewatching it, the thing I was struck by was, wow, they really managed to check off all the boxes, you know, they managed to kind of seamlessly introduce the characters and integrate the characters together. They managed to kind of give each of the uh, Avengers a moment with Loki. Um, Loki is a pretty great villain too. I mean, in the Marvel yes. universe, he's one of the better villains. Um, and they made a nice effort to kind of give him his moment with each of the Avengers. So. Um, and then I started to think about, yeah, I mean, like I said, there's an inevitability about, okay, we take it for granted. But then you think about all the other blockbuster movies and all the other comic book movies that don't work. Um, and, and so it's like, yay for competence. And then <laughs> I, I just loved how you wrote back was like, well, you know, I mean, yay for competence, but I mean, we're kind of settling. It's like, it's like this factory has, um, you know, put forth all of these pretty good, good, and occasionally very good, one great movie. And that what we're celebrating? Is that a cause for celebration? Um, no, but, 
But when you look back at this first Avengers movie, it could have gone much worse. It could have it could have gone horribly wrong, or it could have been just very mediocre. And they did a pretty nice job with it. Um, I understand we are oh, technical. We had some technical issues with the stream, but I think uh, it's okay now. So we're going forward. Yeah. Uh, actually. Never mind. I'm hearing we're going to start from the top, so we're going to restart the stream. So please bear with us. This is our first, our first night out. So uh, we'll be with you in a moment. Jose, do you mean start from the top, like from the very beginning of the show? Oh my God. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Good evening. I'm Justin Chang, film critic at the Los Angeles Times. Welcome to week one of the Ultimate Summer Movie Showdown, the LA Times series where you get to choose the greatest summer movies of all time, or at least since 1975, the summer a little movie called Jaws changed Hollywood history forever. This is a project I've been working on with other writers and editors on the LA Times movie team. With theaters closed and major Hollywood releases being held back due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we asked ourselves, what if instead of having the worst summer movie season ever, we put our heads together and came up with the ultimate summer movie season, singling out the best movies from each week of release going back to 1975. And because summer movie season is all about epic matchups based on release dates, we decided to be similarly arbitrary about it and do this on a week by week basis based on release dates of movies. So this is how it's gonna work. Each week for 16 weeks, we are pull, pulling together some of the best or most memorable big movies from each week of release and letting you, LA Times readers, Twitter voters, and everyone in between, vote for your favorites in a series of head-to-head -head contests posted on my Twitter account. We held our first round of voting last week for movies that were released between May 1st and May 7th, uh, between the years 1975 and 2019. You voted, and your ultimate summer movie showdown champion for week one is The Avengers the Disney Marvel blockbuster, you maybe have heard of it, uh, that was released in theaters on May 4th, 2012. The Avengers beat out such other popular Marvel titles that were also released in that time frame, uh, including Iron Man, Captain America Civil War, as well as other movies like 16 Candles, Dragon the Bruce Lee Story, Dave, and Much Ado About Nothing. The Avengers was directed by Joss Whedon and brought together a mega cast of superheroes some of whom had already appeared in their own solo Marvel adventures, such as Robert Downey Jr., of course, as Iron Man, Chris Evans as Captain America, uh, Chris Hemsworth as Thor. It also introduced Mark Ruffalo as the Incredible Hulk, Dr. Bruce Banner, Scarlett Johansson as Black Widow, and Jeremy Renner as Haw Hawkeye. And of course, spearheading the Avengers, Samuel L. Jackson as Nick Fury, director of the international peacekeeping agency known as S.H.I.E.L.D. Tonight, I will be talking about The Avengers with my colleague and friend, awards columnist and critic, Glenn Whip. And then we will be answering some questions from readers. If you have a question, you can send it to me on Twitter. My account is at Justin C. Chang, or you can share it in the comments section of the Times Classic Hollywood page on Facebook. And so let's get this discussion started. I would like to welcome 
to the Ultimate Summer Movie Showdown live chat, Glenn Whip. Hello, Glenn. Hi, Justin. Hi there. How are you, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling just like a little sense of we should be doing Groundhog Day right now instead <laughs> of the Avengers, but um, I'm not sure if anyone will even get that reference, but you and I will, and that's... Anyway, I am doing great, and it's good to see you again. Um, it's been too long, and I'm excited. I like I, I am just happy that you started this summer movie uh, madness countdown because it has provided me um, countless minutes, hours of time spent on Twitter looking at these polls, thinking what are people thinking, and wishing um, that my favorite movie might win. And um, I think there's some good news for week two on that front, but week one, not a bad choice either. I kind of, kind of expected choice. Yeah, it is an expected choice. This is, uh, you know, in our top two vote getters from week one, uh, it was interesting. It was the Avengers, which won, of course, and the runner up was Sam Raimi's Spider-Man uh, from 2002. It's kind of like we're seeing two, you know, two different eras of Marvel in a way, uh, you know, and that one of course falls outside of the Marvel designated Marvel cinematic universe. It predates the MCU and, you know, the character of Spider-Man, of course, due to various rights issues and conflicts, which are just too tedious to get into right now. Um, but, you know, it was kind of inevitable given just how popular, how ubiquitous these movies are and how ubiquitous comic book superhero movies have become in Hollywood. It was inevitable that, you know, I'm sorry, but, much Ado About Nothing just didn't stand a chance, you know? Um, and it's kind of funny, Kenneth Branagh directed that movie and directed Thor, which we ultimately left out of our, our sweepstakes because we had we, we dropped, it's worth noting, we dropped Thor, uh, we dropped um, Iron Man 2 and Iron Man 3. Both, all of those movies were also released between May 1st and May 7th um, in their respective years. Clearly the first week of May is a popular one for the MCU. It's, it's almost like I imagine they like to, you know, they release their movies at different points throughout the year, but it's like they're almost laying own, laying claim, laying ownership to the summer before it's just as it's getting started. Right. They're establishing yeah. the benchmark right away. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And you know, yeah. and it we you know, and you you know, this movie wasn't our first choice perhaps, but it is um the first choice of our readers. Um, I, and I think it's in, it opens up a fascinating discussion regardless about, you know, critical taste, popular taste. Is there a difference between these two things? I actually tend to think not so much as people like, like to think that there is. Um, but I think it's a, it's a discussion worth diving into um, and about some of the, the, the comforts of franchise cinema and, and the, the frustrations of franchise cinema as well. Um, I certainly liked the Avengers well enough when it came out back in 2012. I had not seen the movie again since then. Um, so I rewatched it and found it, you know, somewhat less thrilling, although certainly still a very well put together, well mounted, um, you know, for a movie that's as long as it is, it, it more or less zips by. What did you think rewatching the movie again after eight years? Yeah. I mean, because I had not seen it since 2012 because I've been busy watching the factory produce more movies. I mean, 2017, 2018, 2019, there have been three Marvel movies each of those years. Um, there have been countless other superhero movies to um, dive into, to pay attention to, to ignore and watch on airplanes later on. Um, but so, this was the first time I had seen it since 2012. And, you know, I have a 17 year old son who devours these movies. I was asking him, I mean, you want to watch it again with me? And then I was, <laughs> that opened a conversation like, well, Sean, I mean, do you think like when you're a dad, are, are you going to just like sit your kids down and watch the Marvel movies with them, you know, from the first one to the last? God knows how many there will be by then. Maybe <laughs> there will, there just won't be enough time. But, and he was like, uh, I don't know. But then he kind of took the question like, dad, are, are you asking me 
to watch all the Marvel movies with you. And he was like kind of asking it, hopefully. Um, and I was, nah, you know, we'll have to see how long this quarantine lasts before we get into that place. But it was fun to watch it again. I, you know, we, you and I wrote a piece together and I was saying, because there have been three every year and we've gone a whole year without seeing a Marvel movie. So it wasn't like there was no fatigue. It was like, ah, yeah, sure. I'll watch a Marvel movie. Yeah. And, it, and it was, it was pretty good. You know, I was joking with you that I was going to bring a, uh, like a chart, a bar, a bar graph charting your sort of ambivalent to the movie as the week went along. <laughs> but, um, and, 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 and the thing that you wrote that, that made me laugh and, and, and gave, you know, gave me pause a little bit was, you know, I was celebrating the competence of this movie, which was not a given, you know, there had been five Marvel movies before this of varying quality. And here was this one that was going to bring them all together. And, you know, would it work? Would it not work? And it ended up working. It ended up working. Let's just say that. It brought all these characters together in a pretty seamless way, integrating them all into the story, uh, giving us, I think, one of the better Marvel villains with Loki, um, giving all of the Marvel, all of the Avengers good moments with Loki. Um, it's it's a it's a pretty enjoyable movie, and when you think about all of the superhero movies and all the blockbuster movies that don't work, um, that's cause for some celebration. But I mean, the thing that was like making me laugh was just like, yay for competence. Yes. Um, <laughs> that's a that's a pretty low bar, isn't it? But yeah, that it's... that is the Marvel franchise, isn't it? It's it's very competent you know, very, you know, you know what you're going to get. And for the most part, it's going to be a pretty good movie. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like we should end, as you say, competence is not something to be taken for granted. Um, it's also something that shouldn't be confused for greatness. You know, I mean, these are basically, and you know, the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies, they are, you know, the meat and potatoes of Hollywood these days. And Something you said about just how even how 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 many of them are released each year, three, sometimes two, but you know, a year, like clockwork. And there is a clockwork precision to these movies. And it's both kind of impressive and kind of annoying because you feel as though sometimes, even when the movie is delivering and really, you know. It's it's not aspiring to anything greater than that, and I'm not saying that they all have to, but um, you feel, and it varies. It varies depending on the characters. Of course, it depends on which of these characters and which of these subplots you gravitate toward. But um, I will say the thing that is, I think, impressive about the Avengers, and the reason people retain their affection for this one, even though, of course, there have been count, there have been 17 other Marvel movies since then is that this is the movie that sort of brought everything together. It was sort of the fulfillment, the realization of the original vision. And I think it was uh, quite an improvement on the movies that had come before, like Thor and Captain America, the first Aven Avenger, uh, which I personally both found them both really erratic and dull. I mean, I liked, I liked Iron Man. I think this is, uh, for better or, wor or worse, uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s signature role. It's just such a good fit for his um, his ability to fire off uh, sardonic one-liners at rapid fire speed. Um, so, you know, and, and watching Joss Whedon put this all together and infuse it with his signature wit, his pop culture savvy, there was this sense of momentum, of convergence, this sense of like, okay, here is this kind of amazing narrative machinery that is fire, finally firing on all cylinders and, um, and everything is integrated. So there's something kind of cool about that. Um, I think it feels less exciting to revisit, um, you know, ten year, eight years later because there have been 17 more movies since, and so, you know, it really, you know, it's it seemed formulaic then. It seems even more formulaic now. It feels like an assembly line, which kind of brings new meaning to the expression "Avengers assemble." Um, but you know, um, 
Yeah. There are, you know, there are bright spots. You know, Tom Hiddleston yeah. is one of them. The actors yeah. are the bright spots in this movie. And it's weird because they're all sort of, you know, they play off very nicely against each other and they do have a nice chemistry. Um, but uh, but it just, it feels like everything is sort of just controlled to within an inch of its life. And I find that that sort of chokes the life out of them. I also just feel watching this movie again, is it weird to you, Glenn, that these movies, which are basically, they're, they're, they fit a lot of different genres. They're, they're comic book movies. They're, they are comedies. And I think the comedy is one of the aspects that works uh, the best and the most consistently. But they're also, you know, first and foremost, perhaps they're action movies. And does it sort of bother you that the action in a lot of these movies, with exceptions, and we'll get to the exceptions soon enough, um, the action is just not really that great in these films. It feels as if they haven't, you know, they've, they've put, taken a lot of care into various other yeah. aspects of world building, various other aspects of structure. But the action just kind of, you know, there, there are some cool moments, but it it just kind of dissipates. It feels weightless. It's completely bloodless, which, you know, yeah, PG-13 rating, I get. But does that bother you a little bit? Well, that was an interesting thing about watching The Avengers again, this movie, in that it opens with this action sequence. And it's um, Loki uh, going to the S.H.I.E.L.D. base, uh, where he finds a number of secondary characters, Nick Fury among them. He'd, he'd object to being called a secondary character. But, but and it's... It's not very good. the The opening of this movie kind of is bad. It's it's this action sequence. The stakes. I mean, it's hard to really care about what's going on, and you, and you really wonder, well, where you know, it's it's a really strange setup. I, and what they're doing is setting up Loki taking, the, you know, the case, and and that puts the the plot into motion. But in terms of an action sequence, it's not very well shot it's not it's not particularly good and and i think that's the i mean you know that's the criticism of most marvel movies is that visually they're not particularly interesting um they're they're kind of drab i mean for all of the um for all of the grief that george lucas's uh, prequel star wars prequels got and and deservedly so um Visually, they were always kind of interesting, you know, amid all the boring dialogue and endless exposition over in the corners of the frames, there was always something kind of interesting going on. He had a real sense a real visual sense um, that's largely absent in these Marvel movies with with exceptions. Um, and, and we celebrate those exceptions. It's such a good point, Glenn, because. It's almost as if the Marvel movies reverse exactly that equation that you describe. Mm -hmm. um, the action is feels pretty indifferently, uh, you know, shot or what or whatnot. And but it's it is the character interplay and the dialogue um, that uh, you sort of lean in toward and that you perhaps most enjoy from these movies. Whereas in certainly in George Lucas's Star Wars prequels, you know, the the, the character interplay is just deadly dull and and stilted. So it's like. Yeah. If we were to somehow reconcile these two polar <laughs> extremes, we would yeah. have the perfect action movie. Maybe I don't know. Yeah. But like um, mentally, yeah. I, mentally, I still have like this block about Marvel movies. Like the last thirty or forty minutes is just going to be this overlong, you know, big action, bang bang, clang clang, and sometimes watching these movies, I just check out. And no. um, that's not good, obviously. Um, so I, you know, watching this Avengers movie again, I thought the last 30 minutes or so, the big action set piece was actually pretty well done. It's one of the better last 30 minutes. You know, it is a 30 minute action sequence um, with Midtown Manhattan being destroyed or at least... Uh, pretty much destroyed and um and Bruce Banner showing up on the the vintage motorcycle and Hulk smashing things very enjoyably i mean i think that's that's the one thing i i guess as as we were talking about the avengers um and writing about it was uh, we seem to have a mutual appreciation for 
Mark Ruffalo and the Bruce Banner character. And, uh, you know, and, and these, you know, these two, you know, warring egos trying to, he's trying to reconcile them. And I just love the Ruffalo. I, I you know, watching this again, I, I loved his introduction. And I love the performance because Ruffalo is kind of an unlikely person to find in this type of movie. And he approaches the conflict, the character's conflict with kind of a, a knowing sense of humor that's really enjoyable to watch. He's just such a wonderful actor, and I think in some ways it's all the more impressive because he had the toughest job in the sense of, you know, playing a very iconic character himself. But, you know, the Hulk has been a, a problematic, a, a difficult character for Marvel to wrangle, and I think that says something, given that they are very good at wrangling just about every aspect and of, of this enterprise and just pummeling everything into submission. Um, right. They haven't been able to do that with the Hulk. I mean, I think they found their way, and it's kind of. You know, I'm not saying that I want another one of these movies, Glenn, but um, but I wouldn't mind seeing Mark Ruffalo's standalone Hulk movie, which I know I was reading, you know, for for a long time, due again to very tedious character rights issues. Uh, they were not able to. They were, that just wasn't going to happen. And I believe, and I'm sure there will be, you know, Marvel scholars correcting me. Um, to tell me that if I'm mischaracterizing any of this or getting details wrong, which I definitely want to do, but I understand that it's not the door is perhaps open on that possibility. And I, you know, I would definitely watch Ruffalo in one of these movies. He he brings a groundedness. Um, he is just a very unassuming actor, which is the kind of actor you want playing um, the Hulk. You know, you, this was a character who was played, of course, in two previous uh, you know movies, both you know, whatever their merits, perceived as disappointments. Uh, he was played by Eric Bana in Ang Lee's Hulk. He was played by Ed Edward Norton in uh, The Incredible Hulk. And so this was this movie just kind of launched, okay, here is Ruffalo as, um, as the Hulk. And he kind of just picked it up and just carried it and ran with it. And, um, you know, he is, I, I, I especially liked his scenes here because, you know, when, you know, Iron Man, and Captain America and Thor are in a room, and the movie just becomes like this giant frat house comedy where the frat house is this, you know, shield, uh, you know, aircraft, watercraft, whatever the hell it is. Um, and, you know, there it's just this, you know, epic trash talking contest between these three guys, and you can just, you know, the testosterone is clearly just, um, you know, it, it's frankly rather stifling. And Ruffalo's there. He's just kind of the most unassuming guy. And yet he is the one, of course, who could just, you know, <laughs> just right. is the most dangerous right. one. So there is this cool tension yeah. there. And um, and I think it, it 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 is to the good of the series and of the story as well. Yeah, that was, I think, rewatching my favorite sequence was on that craft where Ruffalo is kind of on the edges there and he's just kind of being quiet. There is a tension um, that's... So that you don't really see often in these movies um, because it's a, a very subtle, quiet tension that he is just trying to keep it all together. I still don't understand why at the end of the movie he shows up and then suddenly Hulk can control like his rage and who he's directing it toward. I, that's for the Marvel scholars, I guess, to, to enlighten. <laughs> but it was that's enjoyable. Exactly right. you know, both aspects were enjoyable, uh, but I really did dig those early scenes with Ruffalo on the uh, water airship um, where he's just like, ah, you know, it was great. He's really good in those. And yeah, and I think it speaks to, you know, the Hulk, you know, embodies or symbolizes the loss of control, you know, when when rage and, and pure, mm. you know, a sort of agent of pure chaos. And that is something that is, I think, antithetical to the ethos right. of Marvel. So I think there's, I, I don't know if this, you know, I'm sure that there is, you know, um, and I know fans of, you know, Ang Lee's Hulk will, will, will want to quarrel with me because that movie has also been sort of rediscovered and reclaimed as a misunderstood great superhero movie. Um, I'm not actually, it's been too long for me. I don't know where I stand on that um, argument, but um, 
But I think it speaks to, yeah, just how that's why he's problematic for this series. And it's also why he's one of the more interesting, you know, um, guys to have around. And, you know, my favorite moment in this movie, these movies still is, um, uh, certainly of this movie is, you know, you can find that clip on YouTube of Hulk, you know, hoist Loki saying, I am a god, you dull creature. And, you know, and Hulk kind of hoists him up and just like a rag doll and just smashes him over and over again on the ground. And, uh, you know, and that is that is the action highlight of this movie for me, you know, in a movie where right. I personally tend to, you know, I, I, the, the action is a blur, but that scene, uh, it stands out. It feels, it feels personal to me, you know? So mm -hmm. in a way that I wish these movies had a little bit more of, although every, every one of these movies usually has like one or two of those really good. Yeah. Movies. Okay. Where you feel like, okay, that was maybe worth, worth paying to watch this. Right. <laughs> I mean, I guess the, the, the one, downside to the format that you've established here, the summer movie madness, is that the best Marvel movie didn't come out in the summer. It came out in the spring, and that's Black Panther. And and, and that is the movie that has all the things that we have been lamenting here. It has the visual, Ryan Coogler's visual style. Um, it has the greatest Marvel villain, maybe the greatest Marvel character in uh, Eric Killmonger and, and who embodies that sort of loss of control. Although, I mean, he has a plan and he's very um, dedicated toward it. And that's the interesting thing about it, that sort of conflict between um, Killmonger and T'Challa. But um, it's, yeah, that's, that's the movie that I think we had a lot of readers um, asking, well, what's our what's our favorite Marvel movie, or or what would we like to see from Marvel movies? And it's pretty much all there in um, in Black Panther, which um, we're talking about now because we won't be able to talk about it during the summer <laughs> series. Yes, it's a shame. I like to think that that would have you know it would depend on the competition, but I would like to think mm -hmm. that Black Panther. Might have uh, you know trounced uh, well trounced the Avengers certainly, um, and that's a movie that really, in a way that a lot of these movies are not doing. I feel like Black Panther is is really grounded and really in conversation with what is going on in the world, um, and it is a movie right. that is right. uh, it, that you could just see from the outcry, uh, not the outcry, the 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 embrace of this movie and the complexity of what it's doing. Um, and I think that says something because I think, I, you know, if I can correct what I said, it's like, actually these movies are in conversation I, it, with, with what's going on because these movies are basically war movies. There is a very uh, militaristic sensibility at play um, in these films, uh, regardless of whether you, you know, whether you like them or not. And again, I like my fair share of them. Um, and this is what kind of does give me pause maybe a, a little bit about mm. that final sequence in particular. And, you know, this isn't the most egregious example. I mean, if you look at the rival to Marvel uh, DC Comics movies like Man of Steel and, and Justice League and, you know, the, uh, in, the in, in terms of action, the action there is even more bloated, more turgid. But, you know, even with the, in, the, in something like The Avengers at the end, you know, you, you see just, you know, this battle leveling huge chunks of Manhattan and, you know, um, you know, just the, the death toll has to be staggering. And it's, you know, the action is bloodless. You know, the comic banter just persists relentlessly. <laughs> I know this is escapist entertainment, but it's always hard for me to watch some of those scenes. And, you know, and I know, I don't know, it's, I, I'm sure anybody listening to this might say, oh, just, you know, whatever, just, you know, you're supposed to turn your brain off. I don't know if I can completely. I mean, it just, it, it kind of pulls mm. me out a little bit, maybe more than mm. a little bit even. I think it's a little apart. Yeah. Um, yeah. And just, you know, if it were, it, it just, if it, I think it's just because we see that all the time. If it were once in a while, um, I might, you know, have that, weirdly have more of a tolerance for it. But I think it's just that kind of apocalyptic blowout. Um, it's, it's just hard, you know, it just, we see it too often, you know. Um, yeah. It'll be, yeah, but... And I could you know, be unfair. I mean, I said that, you know, it seems like every Marvel movie ends with that apocalyptic blowout. Um, and I'm sure there are exceptions. But just in my, I mean, that's that's the thing about these movies. I mean, there's 23. So they all just, and, and you say they are of a piece. So they are in conversation with each other. 
And so they all start to kind of blend together into this um, formula. And yeah, I, you, you check out and I think some of the checking out is also a defense mechanism against you're not particularly enjoying what you're seeing. It's, it's, it's a little bit um, offensive to, to your soul, you know? Um, but, but, but again, it is, they, the, these scenes are so bloodless that they're not, they're not scarring you in, in a way that the great movies would, where they would just sort of like make you think about what you're seeing, make you think about, um, humanity, make you think about the destruction. Um, they're just, it's just, yeah, it's just, and it goes on, and then, and then you're waiting for the the the, the mid credits and end credits tags. Yeah. <laughs> and just I'm, okay, I'm gonna stay for these. They will it'll give me a little something to smile about, <laughs> or um, or or as you said earlier, something to puzzle over with um, with someone yeah. who knows what's going on. Yeah, and of um, course, you know, it's just yeah. Go ahead. No, 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 no. Go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, this this kind of you know one apocalypse after another, and of course building to you know many movies from this one um, in Avengers: Infinity War when half the world is sort of, of course wiped out with a snap of a finger, and so um, you know which turned out to be the ultimate uh, you know whether you think of it as a, a, a stunning, brilliant reversal or just a narrative cheat or whatnot, you know where that you know. The past can be rewritten to some extent, and time can be turned, and the dead can be brought back. So you know, it's uh, yeah, this movie. You know, these are movies that are sort of very much toying with sort of the metaphysics of of, of death and of, of war. And so you know, and it's like, and again, it's I'm not even, you know, I don't want to, and I don't want to, I don't want to think too hard about this one. I already feel like I'm thinking too hard. So maybe we should just leave this here because I'm, you know, can be. But, uh, and I think, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> We're not supposed to think too hard about um, most summer movies. Um, although I, I think there are going to be some some great exceptions um, as the summer moves along. Um, but I like, like I said at the outset, uh, this this gives us both a little, um, you know, diversion. We're looking for diversions right now. Um, I mean, nor. I, our jobs have changed quite a bit. I mean, you are normally seeing, you're going to screenings. What have you been doing uh, the past yeah. couple of months? What's How has your life changed as a film critic? Yeah, you know, it's changed in some ways. It's changed in a lot of ways. My God, all of our lives have changed and our work has changed, of course. Um, I was, you know, I work from home most of the time already. Uh, so that didn't change too much, except now my my family is home too and we're all trying to work um, and get things done um, in, and get used to new setups and everything. I feel like I've watched the same number of movies. Of course, I'm not seeing, you know, I'm not going to screenings. Um, I'm watching a lot more old, older films as, as I can on Criterion Channel, uh, which is one of the best uh, platforms out there. And I do recommend uh, anyone paying attention, um, please, you know, if you, can, if you can subscribe to Criterion Channel, it's a great, um, great platform, just wonderful classic, classic Hollywood cinema, uh, classic foreign language cinema, you know, just it's it's well worth the investment. Um, but yeah, I've actually been trying to keep better track. I don't know if you do this, Glenn. I, you, I didn't, but I've been doing it now, keeping track of my viewing. I used to keep a viewer log like maybe decades ago <laughs> and I gave up on it just because I just, you know, I, I got lazy. And here I figured, well, this is a good time to revive it and actually track how many movies I've been watching. I think I average about 16 a month, which is okay. You know, I yeah. could do better, but yeah. How about you? How is the, how have things changed? Um, yeah, yeah. I just working. I I mean, it, it, it makes me laugh because yeah. I mean, we work from home a lot, but now we are working from home with our families. My wife is a school teacher, and she's just like, your life really hasn't changed at all. You're still just sitting on the couch with your laptop, writing and and watching things. And um, while, you know, her, her work has just radically changed because she's not in the classroom anymore. But, I mean, it's been a nice opportunity. I mentioned my son earlier. I have been taking the, uh, this opportunity to kind of introduce him to 
like my favorite movies um, and mixing in some that I think he, <laughs> well, my favorite movies that I think he would like. So I've been, we've watched uh, Coen Brothers movies like Fargo, Big Lebowski. We've watched um, There Will Be Blood, you know, trying to introduce right. him to, you know, starter films from the great film, from my favorite filmmakers. And, you know, mixing in a little Die Hard and kind of action movies. Um, doing a little programming here to Whip Household. Um, <laughs> and that's and that's been enjoyable. But man, yeah, I mean, we did that piece earlier. Just can't wait to get back out and yeah. see a movie with um, hundreds of other people. I don't know when that's going to be, but uh, for me, it can't be soon enough. <laughs> what? Same um, here. So, as we as we as we march through this this uh, summer movie showdown, what is the movie that you want to see prevail? What's your favorite summer movie? Do you have a do you have one that's dear to your heart? Yes, I do. You know, I don't know if this is the best of all time, um, but I would be thrilled to see it prevail in its week, which I think is a very competitive week. But I am going to say my favorite summer movie is Speed. Um, you know, the wonderful and uh, still just fantastic action thriller starring Keanu Reeves, Sandra Bullock, and the late, great Dennis Hopper. Um, you know, just a great L.A. movie, um, a great transit movie. <laughs> so that, my wife's an urban planner, so it's just, it's just um, that's uh, another thing that I love about it. Um, a great just L.A. landscape uh, layout movie. Um, and there are just, and it's, I, I think it's incredibly romantic as well as kinetic. Um, there are scenes in this movie that I actually do just kind of replay over and over again, even if it's just the clips on YouTube, if I need, I don't know, an adrenaline burst or I need wow. to wake myself up uh, while I'm writing because I'm boring myself to tears. Uh, I'll just throw that on and it works great. I've never seen it in a movie theater. And my God, if I ever got the chance, I mean, needless to say, we'll both be thrilled when movie theaters open. I will watch anything in a theater once once I can. But if I get her the chance to see this on the big screen, I would take take it in a heartbeat. That's yeah. that's interesting to hear you say that because I was going to ask you if your if your choice of speed was related to an experience that you had in a theater or how you saw it or some yeah. memories of seeing it. Because I mean, great movie. I love Speed too, but it's not necessarily what I would pick as like you know, the typical greatest, you know, it's not going to show up on a ton of lists. So, but no, you saw it like on TV. Yeah, I, I did actually, because yeah. I mean, and not to give me my, my age, I mean, I was like 11 years old when that movie came out and mm -hmm. I could have gone to see the theater. I was also a pretty squeamish kid. Um, now I'm sort of just a squeamish adult, but um you know, that movie was a lot to take for an 11, at least for, for an 11 year old of my constitution. So I think I didn't see it in theaters, but I heard, you know, everyone was raving about it. Family members had seen it and loved it. And I watched it on, you know, VHS, good old VHS, and just had a complete blast with it. So, um, and I, and again, I watched again, I think last year or the year before, and it just holds up quite beautifully. So, um, but yeah. I'm, put, I'm well, putting that one up next for my son. That's that's Good. the next one we're gonna watch. He hasn't seen that one. It's a great one. Hope he enjoys it. Um, well, Glenn, uh, I'm going to let's go back to the Avengers really quickly, um, and then we're going to go to our readers. I think we have some reader questions. Um, yeah. We sort of talked about this already. You know, we talked about how much we like Mark Ruffalo, but are there any other standouts in this uh, this whole MCU for you? Mm -hmm. um, and if it's no, that's totally fine because you know they all kind of blur together for me. Well, but I think yeah, there are some yeah. really good actors. Yeah, but um, but please. No, I, I mentioned Michael B. Jordan and Eric Killmonger Fantastic. earlier, so that's that's probably my favorite, just because the villain to me was the hero of that movie, you know, in in some sense or in in every sense, um, which made it such an interesting viewing experience. Um, I was also thinking, you know, as we were doing this about the the 23 movies and then what a kind of breath of fresh air that um, the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie was uh, mm. kind of arrived at a time when we needed some new Marvel characters and we needed kind of a standalone that had a 
had a real sense of humor um, about it, um, a playfulness. And that was a movie that had just a host of really well-defined, fun characters. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I that was... That was the movie as I was thinking about the 23 other than Black Panther. And, and there are certainly, um, I love Dr. Strange. Um, the Taika Waititi Thor is, is enjoyable too. Um, but yeah, I, probably the Guardians movie. And again, so many of these summer movies, these Marvel movies are kind of tied to the experience. And I had a really good time seeing that movie with both of my kids. Absolutely. And I would just, yeah. yeah. And I, I would just add that I think just visually what the Guardians of the yeah. Galaxy does and what Doctor Strange does as well, um, just there is there's an inventiveness in the visuals of those movie of those movies that feels like it's not just cleaving to the usual house style. There's a trippiness, uh, there's a surrealism to the to the visuals of those movies that is very, very welcome. So that's great. And, you know, we have a lot of questions, which we won't get to all of them, but I'm looking through my email and my Twitter right now. Uh, we have a question from reader Ali Blair. What makes a good MCU movie? What do you look for in order to give it a good review? And these questions are for me and Glenn. Um, Glenn, do you have an answer to this or do you want me to take it? Or um... <laughs> I, I love that I have... you passed it over to me. I, mean, <laughs> I, I think we think we've talked about this you know quite a bit um the ones and you and you just mentioned and, and you're absolutely right about the visual style the interesting visual style of of dr strange and the and at least the first guardians movie um you know anything that kind of starts to take us away from that factory formula um and you know we're responding to uh story and characters um and so, yeah, I mean, with me, Black Panther, because of the stakes, and you didn't have um, necessarily always that sense of there's something at stake in these things. It was more kind of moving the pieces into place um, to get to the next chapter. Um, and a great villain helps, too, which is why I really, um, I really did enjoy this Avengers movie, because Tom Hiddleston is so good. He really is. Um, I would just really quickly say that, you know, to me, what makes a good MCU movie is not really that much different from what makes a good movie, period. You know, I mean, I'm not holding it, I think, to some really different or loftier standard. You know, I'm looking for well-drawn characters, well-directed action scenes, uh, well-directed dialogue scenes, which are sometimes even harder to do. And you're looking for some measure of unpredictability, which is a hard thing to pull off, I think, when you have these movies locked into this very rigid narrative blueprint. So... But I think the good ones have managed to transcend that one, like Black Panther, like Doctor Strange. Um, so, which I, um, I know I'm, we're not alone in admiring those two, um, perhaps a little bit higher than some of the others. Uh, we have some questions, uh, two, two questions that I think are actually kind of dovetailed. One, uh, Sarah Nusleen, and uh, what cultural influences do you think we'll see more of in the coming years of superhero films? And a similar question, which I'll, uh, sh from Shannon O'Connor, what hurdles would you like to see the MCU films jump next. I think, you know, hurdles and cultural influences, I think, are both something we can pull package together because um, because I think diversity and I think representation and cultural influence, um, it, I don't like to think of them as a hurdle, but I think that, that it does pose this question, this obstacle for every, you know, for Hollywood movies of all kinds, and especially these. And, you know, the, the MCU movies, like them or dislike them, have absolutely been, um, you know, catalysts for change in that department. You know, there's something to be said very much for seeing, um, you know, actors who look like my, you know, people of color or seeing more women at the, at the, at the fore of these. Um, and I think that in general, they've done better with actors of color than they have with women. Although one of the postponed movies from this year, of course, from the summer is uh, Black Widow starring um, Scarlett Johansson. So that one will be very much worth seeing. I hope, we hope, we live in eternal hope. Um, there's The Eternals directed by Chloe Zhao which will feature, you know, Gemma Chan and Kumail Nanjiani, Brian Tyree Henry, um, playing, I believe, the first LGBT su superhero in, a, in an MCU movie. Um, there's the new Shang-Chi Shang movie starring Simu Liu. So 
there's something to look forward to, I think, in terms of cultural influences, in terms of the hurdles that they'll they'll cross over. And hopefully that will, you know, whether the movies are good or bad, um, hopefully that will create some meaningful differences. Um, another question from Clay Bryce on Twitter. Uh, when about to begin a review, how do you know how to start it? What is your approach? I'm having a hard time doing so in my film class at school. I love questions like this, you know, these are general film review process questions. Glenn, do you have a process? <laughs> I, I think you, uh, I think you want to start it better than the Avengers started. Um, you don't want to start it with a, uh, a drab action sequence where no one really cares or knows what's <laughs> going on. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't think reviews are necessarily any different um, in writing those than writing any piece of, uh, than writing any story. I mean, you want to, I mean, your job as, as a writer is to grab the reader and to make them really want to read what you have to say uh, moving forward. So um, with the review, I mean, there's just so many different ways you can do that. You can kind of set a scene. You can start with a provocative take. I'm not going to say a hot take, just <laughs> an informed, let's say an informed take. And, um, but you, you want to, you want to establish, I mean, you want to establish um, interest right away. And why, you know, why should the reader read on? Why do they, why should they care what you think? Uh, I don't know. What do you think, Justin? It's such a yeah, big I question. Agree. And, and it really varies. And there's yeah. so many ways to do it. It really does vary. And you know, I want I want this questioner to get a good grade in uh, their uh, film class. So um, I would say something that maybe I I do a lot and maybe overuse, but I think it's just because it's just a very handy device to have is what you said the scene setting lead in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's just helpful for my benefit whether I end up using that uh, way in or scrapping it all together. It's like, I don't, you know, it's hard to, you know, you don't want to start with a topic sentence or something. It's just, it's hard to, my, my goal is just to find my way into the movie. And a lot of time that is best accomplished with writing about a scene that stood out to you. And that is not just important in terms of the plot or whatnot, but that actually, you know, maybe there's something of visual interest going on. Maybe there's something about it that has some ideas that are, um, you know, explored in the movie. Some, there's something kind of representative or symbolic emblematic about that scene. I think that is helpful. So I would say that if you're if you're having the writer's block, just think about what stuck out to you about the movie best, you know, and it can be something, it can be, a, it can be an actor, it can be, you know, something about an actor's face, something about their expression, something about the clothes they're wearing, you know, it's like, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's good to sort of sometimes fix, uh, focus on physical details because of course, this is a visual medium we're writing about and you want to write about, you know, write about it in a way that engages the visual quality of, of the medium. So if one more question um, from Brian Simington on the Facebook page, uh, as movie reviewers, how often do you rewatch movies at all? A good question. All the time, or try to. You also wanna see, you know, you also wanna watch all the stuff that you haven't seen. And there's, a, you know, even as people who make their living by watching movies, there's so much we haven't seen. Um, Glenn, do you feel the same way? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, there is, I mean, especially right now when we're not allowed to really go outside and, and do a whole lot, um, we find ourselves with just this chasm of time um, that's easy to fritter away. But it's also just this opportunity to either dive into things that we've watched before and find comfort in, it's also a time to explore things that we haven't seen that we know we should have or or just things that we've heard about and want to explore. And um, yeah, it's I finding that balance uh, is sometimes hard. I think right now what we're going through is um, kind of wanting to, I think for a lot of people maybe are watching, you know, they have that Disney Plus subscription. And maybe there are a lot of people making their way through the 23 Marvel movies right now as a, as a way of getting through this time. And if you are, and if you are finding 
pleasure in that. I say hats off, keep on. Absolutely. And uh, Glenn, I am reassured by the great wall of physical media behind you. It looks like you are all set, even if yeah. you know internet connections fail us, uh, the cloud fails us. You will be you will be set. I hope. Yeah. Uh, I have I hope my I will be too. Yeah. Portable <laughs> generator and and you know the DVD player is hooked up and yeah, I'm ready to go. We are well. I think we have contributed enough Marvel discourse to the world uh, for one night. So I would like to thank you, Glenn, for being the most uh, eloquent and convivial of co-hosts. Thank you. Thank you to our Times readers for voting on these movies. Thank you for watching The Avengers this past week and sharing your questions, if you did, on Twitter and Facebook. Um, I will keep those comments coming. Um, and I wanted to say, too, give our readers, uh, give our viewers a little taste of what is to come. This is, of course, just week one of the ultimate summer movie showdown. Here is what is ahead for week two. Now this week two covers uh, movies that were released between May 8th and 14th. It was a very competitive week with movies, as you can see, like Friday the 13th, The Natural, Short Circuit, The Crow, Twister, which came pretty close, um, and the 2009 Star Trek. But in the end, this came down to two movies. Luc Besson's delirious 1997 sci-fi extravaganza, The Fifth Element, starring Bruce Willis and Mila Jovovich, and Paul Feig's hilarious 2011 comedy, Bridesmaids, starring and co-written by Kristen Wiig. The voting between these two movies was neck and neck pretty much the whole way, but in the end, there could only be one winner, and that winner was Bridesmaids. Yes. Good voting, everyone. Uh, you know, I think it, Bridesmaids came away with like 50.4 percent of the vote um so uh a very very close call um you know fifth element fans have uh, nothing to be ashamed of so um yeah i'm really excited to be talking about bridesmaids uh next week uh, a week from from today same same time 6 p.m right here and i look forward to being with you then thank you for being with us good night